What's up, punks? All right, today is September 29th, uh, Sunday, and we are bringing you a Block Digest special edition with Lightning developer Nadav of Sherdbits from Boulder, Colorado. And uh, since, you know, Rick uh, knows Nadav a little better than me, I'm going to toss the rest of the intro off to him. Well, yeah, yeah, uh, Nadav is, uh, Nadav Cohen here is one of the Lightning developers for Sherdbits, but he showed up at my meetup like a... Uh, a little over a year ago now, whenever we were first bringing Chris Stewart on of Shared Bits to talk about Bitcoin Scala and the updates of uh, what Shared Bits was doing over there. And yeah, I ran into the dive and you started talking about all the stuff you're doing there with Lightning and, you know, really interesting discussions for a long time now. And you started doing the blog post there for Shared Bits and we've seen some really good blog posts there talking about some new things that you've been working on. And really wanted to bring you on to talk about him. So, yeah, it's great to have you here today. Well, thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, why don't you, uh, or, yeah, Shinobi, you want to first start telling us about some of these blog posts that we should be, uh, you know, reading into. Yeah, I'll, real real quick before that, I also want to uh, say, if you want to hear uh, Nadav talk about the same stuff, he uh, will be here today uh, in person. Uh, if you're going to the Berlin Hackathon, uh coming up next month he's going to be speaking there as well but you know i guess two of the main series of blog posts uh you know i wanted to talk about today are your posts on the payment point concept uh to replace hash locks in bitcoin and then uh, after that um integrating uh discrete logarithmic contracts into lightning network and so i guess you know uh you start with uh payment points uh I guess you you kind of want to break down um, you know what those are. I know we went a little bit into uh, you know potential confusion points with that before we started, but you want to just let it rip. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so right now, uh, routing uh, over the Lightning Network works using these things called HTLCs, uh, hashed time lock contracts. Basically, uh, with each of your peers along a route, uh, each person says. Uh, here's some money, but only if you reveal the pre-image to this hash. And so that uh, gets set up all the way to the person getting paid, and they know the pre-image because uh, they created the hash, which was part of the invoice. And then they reveal that pre-image, and then the next person can reveal it, and so on and so forth. So basically, it's a way of making uh, payments between multiple hops uh, along a route atomic uh, without requiring you know people trust each other and such. But uh, it has a couple drawbacks with the current scheme, uh, specifically by using hashes in this way. Uh, everybody along a route uses the same hash. Um, and what that means is if you have two malicious nodes who are talking to each other who find out that they have the same payment hash, then they can steal the funds of everyone in, or sorry, not the funds, the fees from everyone in between them while still holding their funds hostage uh, until the timeout, which, uh, you know, putting up that capital is what you are doing in return for a fee. So uh, not a great situation, uh, along with like, you know, kind of a loss in privacy and, and some other issues as well. Uh, so an alternative is to use payment points. And what this means is um, rather than having your, your kind of hops set up as give me the pre-image to this hash, Instead, you're saying, give me the scalar to this point. Or uh, in other words, it's basically like mathematically equivalent to saying, like, give me the private key to this public key. Or obviously, this isn't like a public key that is attached to funds or anything like that. It's just like what I mean when I say a point and a scalar is you can think like a public key and a private key. So it's, it's so like it's, an extra lock, not something that replaces the, the main key. Totally. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 or it's, it's kind of instead of the hash as the one-way function, we're going to be using points as one-way functions uh, because they have some nicer properties. Specifically, like the general problem is that hashes destroy information, so you can't really do much with them. Uh, whereas with points, if you add two points together, it's like adding the two scalars underneath them together. And so what you can do is you can add a random number for each hop. So the person who creates uh, the onion, the person who starts the payment, 
uh, basically creates a nonce for each hop. And so each person gets a different point. And so you're not able to tell that you're on the same uh, path. It's better for privacy. It's better for a lot of things. And then on top of that, since I mentioned you have this extra structure here, you can do stuff like uh, validating certain properties of uh, the the pre-image that you're going to be getting. So it, it enables a bunch of other cool proposals. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so th this is kind of like, you know, me, myself, um, one of the, the points I kind of struggled with mostly um, and kind of trying to understand payment points. But so kind of the, the, the metaphorical way I've been thinking about this is kind of just you remove the hash lock from the script on this HTLC output and effectively just replace it with another key. And the, the whole trick here is you're pretty much passing like multiple keys added together but in a way where um, when things start rolling back to the person making the payment everybody uh, along that route is able to kind of subtract um, you know the values they have from the multiple keys added together to get the one key they actually need totally yeah and and the key thing to remember uh, when thinking about things this way is that uh, for each hop along the way like everything's already added together so to them like it looks like they're just getting one point and one random number that they should be adding and subtracting um to that point uh and and so for each individual hop it's it's quite simple and it's just a little bit of added complexity though not very much to the person who starts the payment yeah so it's just like instead of um you know telling everybody make a, an output with this hash lock is just make an output with this specific point and I've made a different point for everybody instead of reuse the same one. Totally, yeah, and people are, are calling it uh, PTLCs, so point time lock contracts. So yeah, exactly that. We're just replacing hashes with points where you add a random number each way forward and subtract that same random number each way back. Okay, and now here's, I think, the next potential um, confusion point, um, you know, at, the, at least, again, for me going through this all initially, um, is this kind of works the same way mathematically that adapter signatures on Schnorr work, but it could be done without Schnorr, just with a new opcode. Yeah, this is, this is true. So we could uh, introduce, like, an op compute public key or, or something like public point, um, and into Bitcoin, and then you could basically just replace a lot of the op hash 160s or op you know op hashes with uh, op take point or, or something like this, and everything should work basically the same. Uh, though obviously we're not uh, expecting this to be the way that this gets implemented in the end. Mm -hmm. It's just thinking, you know, I, I do like the way that you you've kind of gone through with this whole um, concept, though, is that you know you've kind of thought about it abstractly and shown we can do it with Schnorr signatures or without it instead of just kind of um, you know conflating the whole concept as like adapter signatures and Schnorr are the only way to do it because that was kind of like the, the hardest part with me going through this is like teasing apart like okay these are separate things completely even though the mathematics is pretty much the same. Totally yeah and, and I think um... Yeah, I mean, it's kind of it fits into the the layered structure of the Lightning Network itself, where we're talking about the layer above payment channels, which is the like routing uh, layer, and I or maybe above the onion, but um, yeah, and and I think uh, that that's probably like that's the way I've been thinking about it in my in my blog posts. I I don't really mention adapter signatures more than just like in passing. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I guess, you know, a way you could think about it is, like, right now, the HTLC that uses hash locks, we could, I guess, call HTLC 1.0, you know, then a, a payment point new opcode, I guess, 1.1, we could call um, something using Schnorr adapter signatures 1.3, and like, there's multiple ways to accomplish the same goal with different trade-offs. Totally, yeah. And for those who don't know, uh, just so I should say, adapter signatures are basically a way of um, doing kind of like, uh, I mean, it, it, it's used in like, if you want to do a scriptless atomic swap, it, the idea is 
uh, I give you something very close to a signature, and then if you complete that signature with something you know um, and publish it anywhere, or if I ever see the full signature that isn't just the adapter signature, then I learn the secret that I wanted to learn. Um, so it's this way of doing kind of like a, a uh, an atomic swap between a signature and a secret, uh, which is, and specifically that secret is a scalar to a point. So it works perfectly for kind of the thing we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Heck yeah, man. I mean, it's really just like, uh, you know, some awesome high level math there that, uh, you know, whenever you first started talking to me about it, I was just like kind of blown away. And then I started reading the, uh, the blog post and it's still just like, it's heavy up there. But I mean, like you, you've really kind of showed me something different about math. I know that you've got a strong passion for it. You like always kind of think about it differently and more abstractly where I'm kind of following that formulaic way everybody's been taught. But uh, yeah, it's really interesting stuff with these payment points. And um, like we're saying, I mean, it's a different way to use like a different scaling solution here, similar to Schnorr and adaptive signatures, like where is the use case for these uh, payment points? Yeah, so kind of like I alluded to, um, the, the first thing they accomplish is they get rid of these wormhole attacks. Uh, and, and so that I think is like, you know, a good win even on its own if there was no other reason to adopt payment points other than just like hashes are bad because they correlate payments, um, then that would be great. But they also do a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so like I mentioned, um, you know, having, having this point doesn't destroy all the information about the underlying like pre-image scalar. Uh, and so it lets you do a bunch of stuff, uh, specifically um, some of the things I've talked about in blog posts, which probably isn't an exhaustive list, but they're some of my favorites, uh, are you can sell uh, Schnorr signatures to things uh, in, in a trustless way. And what I mean by that is... Um, it's possible to compete. So a signature, first of all, is just a number, uh, and uh, it's you know it's it's not just a number, but it is a number, um, and it's possible to compute the public point, the public key, so to speak, for this number if it was treated as a private key, um, with only public information. In fact, this is how you it, doing this is part of what you do to validate a signature as you compute the public key and compare it to the public key of the signature. Um, and so what you can do is you can compute this like public key of the signature from just public information and then use it as a payment point. And what this means is you will get paid if and only if you reveal a like a valid signature of a specific message to me. And um, this like as a construct itself has you know, a ton of, of use cases. Um, I've, I've heard talk of it being used for blinded side chains. I've personally talked about, uh, and this is probably, I, I can talk about it more later when we talk about DLCs, but uh, you can use it to create option discrete log contracts by uh, selling your, your signatures. Basically, when you're, when you're doing a contract setup on Bitcoin, one party can sell their signatures and you basically get uh, what's essentially like a premium being paid for an option to execute something later. <laughs> um, and yeah, but that's just like one one thing that you can do with payment points. Another thing that uh, has been posted to the mailing list is you can do these escrow contracts where you uh, write down some like contract uh, in whatever programming language you want. Both parties sign it. You set up a payment using some third party, though they don't need to know so long as people are cooperating and then basically the the secret or the pre-image to the point um can be computed by both the buyer the person doing the payment and the escrow if they get involved um and if everyone's cooperating the buyer will just reveal this after like you know the contract has settled and the say i'm paying someone to like mow my lawn then once they've mowed my lawn i reveal the pre-image to them i like hit pay on my app or whatever uh, and then they would get paid. Uh, and in the case of a dispute, then um, the third party can come in and look at the terms of the contract, where this contract could be like literal like writing, or it could be code, uh, depending on the use case for a lot of digital stuff. You know, code will do the trick really well, and all of your escrows can be automated and open sourced. Um, but basically, they have the ability to reveal a secret to the seller that will also let them kind of construct uh, the, the pre-image to the point um 
yeah and that's that's another use case i personally find really exciting uh and then the last one uh can kind of be done without payment points but not well uh and that's stuckless payments which is kind of fixing a ux problem that uh exists on the lightning network that is that your payments can get stuck on setup and then you have like some crazy like i i don't know exactly what the the default numbers are but think like it could take like m- multiple blocks basically uh and until that times out and basically what that means is that your your funds are held hostage for that time they're not at risk you're gonna get them back um but say say like an, a node that you're routing through is offline and you didn't know and for some reason something's wrong and they're not like it's not getting failed uh they go offline in the middle of setting it up is probably a better uh reason for why this would happen uh, or someone's just malicious and not routing for you. And, you know, they look like they're going to and they set it up on one side and then they don't on the other side. Um, so anyway, uh, these are called stuck payments, you know. Uh, I, I don't think that's like a technical term, but that's what you call them. Um, and so the stuckless payment proposal basically introduces an update phase between setup and settlement, which means that um, you can try multiple routes at the same time or say like one you know a a second or two pass and it they didn't get back to you or you know the the payment isn't set up yet you can just try it again uh and uh, eventually one of them will go through to your intended recipient who acts and then you um then update which gives them what they need in order to complete the payment and so in this way you update only one of your payments uh if you're (laughs) being smart and uh it basically lets you trustlessly retry stuck payments. Um, and it essentially works best with payment points is how I'll phrase that. Heck yeah, man. Well, that's where it's like, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit before, like how there's this recent vulnerability that has come out and there's a lot going on with the Lightning Network. It's been under development for like two years. And, you know, some of these uh, major points in the system have found, you know, a place where, you know, there needs to be some some sort of other option. And so this sounds like a great thing to, uh, you know, move forward with and see, like, yeah, if we can solve some of these problems that have recently sort of cropped up within the Lightning Network. Totally. Uh, though I, 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 sorry. I, 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 I kind of wanted to uh, get into uh, the, the stuckless payments uh, a bit more. But because um, it's, you know, that, that and the wormhole attack being addressed, I think, are like the two um, most important like really applications of payment points. But one thing I wanted to ask about like the stuckless payments, because you, you say like try uh, payment multiple times at once. And kind of the first thing I asked is <clears throat> like, could you kind of just start with a payment out of one channel and then after only using money from that one channel, attempt to route um, multiple ways from that way. So you are only using um like uh one times uh the amount of your own capital that the the payment is uh yeah so no it it doesn't solve the problem of your funds being locked up for the remainder of the timeout um simply because uh how how things are working on on the back end is you are adding these commitments to your or sorry these htlcs to your commitment transactions and uh yeah i I don't think that there's a trustless way of removing those, right? Like from your end, you could remove those because you know you're not going to up like update that payment. But uh, from your counterparty's end, like they can't trust that you won't do that, right? Like they would be taking a risk if they are still liable to pay but can't themselves get paid. Um, and and so what that means is that uh, for all of these like retried payments, you still have funds locked up for the remainder of the timeout. But um, once that time it's over, you know, you get those funds back. You're not going to lose multiple payments to okay, the same I invoice. I see what you're saying. Like the, the, the receiver. Yeah, okay. I, I, yeah, 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 I see where. Uh, so I, so I would say it right. solves like the, the most pertinent UX problem, which is like the payment doesn't go through. Uh, but it doesn't solve like the, the, the second level, maybe a UX problem, but maybe like it doesn't even reach the UX of just like some of your capital isn't available. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I just wasn't thinking that through because, yeah, the, the receiver would be able to just go, ha, and accept all three, even though the payer only paid for one of them. Totally. Okay, yeah. 
but you know um isn't um you know as far as the like the, the escrow application of uh you know using payment points on um the lightning network like this well, you know one thing i, I kind of wanted to point out about that though is isn't the, the logic of that pretty much just the the same as an htlc so like you're you're effectively just creating this construct that cooperatively like leaves the just updating and going with it the best option but it's, it's still like you know if, if somebody stops cooperating like this channel has to be closed and go to chain and deal with the economics of like how big is that um, HTLC output and so on. Um, so actually, uh, so th so there are a way of doing escrow contracts over Lightning that uh, would require some like serious changes to Lightning and in, in terms of like new kinds of outputs that you'd put on your channel. Um, but in in this particular way of executing them, it has the downside of its only one way payments. You can't have like depending on what happens, the money goes different ways. I mean, you can kind of set this up by having multiple payments pointing in multiple directions, but um, essentially. Uh, what what we have here at like just you know the simplest level is we have a single payment going in a single direction, where um, the person getting paid, you know, has this PTLC, uh, which is essentially like an HTLC for points, um, where they know the point uh, and they don't know the underlying secret and they can learn it in one of two ways. So actually it doesn't even require, if the escrow sides with them in case of a dispute, you don't even have to go on chain. The escrow just tells them a secret and then they're able to compute the pre-image to this point and complete everything on the lightning network without going on chain. But I mean like, um, doesn't that still require, okay, that, that would still require your channel counterparty updating out of the yeah. HTLC state though so if yeah, you were yeah, like yeah. directly like peered with somebody you see what I mean like they could refuse to like take that next step totally yeah in, in which case uh, so you still have the same like lightning uh, kind of like setup in, in terms of payment channels um, but uh, basically what I'm saying is like this extra escrow layer on top of things uh, doesn't add any anything to that or any case where or I mean I guess you could argue if you know you're in a channel with someone they might have an incentive to like not cooperate when you're trying to settle this payment um but but other than that like say you're routing then it's not really a consideration mm -hmm. okay, so it's pretty much like just just like a, you know like we were saying earlier it's just like another version of a of an htlc with like like version one whatever Totally. And, it, and it's the, the cool thing is it's indistinguishable. So if we implement payment points to get rid of these wormhole attacks, uh, even if, you know, we don't get the, the stuckless payment stuff in, which would require like actual protocol changes, we get uh, escrow contracts and selling signatures for free. Like uh, it would be indistinguishable from normal payments. Nobody would be able to tell that this is what was happening. Um, and yeah, that, that would be just kind of for free if we switch to payment points. Mm -hmm. Eric, uh, you got anything else uh, you want to kind of plumb through on payment points? Man, not really other than, you know, I mean, I would suggest, uh, yeah, we're going to put the blog post in the show notes so everybody can read through that and, uh, you know, they can go through it themselves. And, yeah, that's a lot to cover and hopefully we can get these things implemented. And, uh, yeah, we'll have uh, both those blog posts. You want to go into the DLCs now? Uh, sure. W one thing, though, uh, just I, I feel like I should mention, like, you know, yeah. this payment point stuff sounds awesome. And, you know, uh, oftentimes people ask me, like, what's the drawback? Like, what's what's the pushback? Why don't we have these? Um, and, and the answer is, like, I have yet to talk to someone. Like, I was at Scaling Bitcoin uh, a couple weeks ago and talked to a lot of people about this. Uh, and I, I haven't talked to anyone who isn't you know, for this and, and isn't excited about this. But um, basically the the best way of implementing this uh, that, you know, wouldn't require new opcode and Bitcoin that isn't already getting in and wouldn't require like any real changes outside of just like changing some stuff on the Lightning Network. Um, and, and kind of just like in general, the best way to do this is with Schnorr adapter signatures. Um, and, and since that's the case, there's not really too much movement. As, as uh, Shinobi mentioned, it is possible to do it without uh, Schnorr adapter signatures, but I don't think that anyone is 
uh, currently willing to invest a bunch of developer hours um, f- for this purpose when they know it's just going to be replaced with Schnorr adapter signatures once uh, BIP Schnorr gets in. So mm-hmm. I think once BIP Schnorr gets in, we'll, we'll start to see work on uh, the implementation of payment points. Um, and then as, as far as like rollout is concerned, um, they're not uh, interoperable with HTLCs. So basically mm-hmm. channels will have to signal uh, which or both of uh, HTLCs and PTLCs they support. Um, and then you'll kind of hopefully see a, a transition over to payment points. Uh, but basically you'll have kind of like two uh, disjoint sets of things that you can route through depending on which way you're routing. Mm-hmm. And, and also it's just like, you know, there's like, why would anybody bother spending time doing this a uh, different way until... Like, or unless Schnorr became, like, non-viable or wasn't going to happen or something. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think everyone is also, you know, I, from what from my understanding, VIP Taproot is a pretty uncontroversial uh, thing at a high level, at least. Like, everyone wants it to be part of Bitcoin. Everyone sees it as the future of how Bitcoin transactions work. Um, and, and I think that uh, this is kind of like... Likewise, most people think that payment points is the plan for Lightning. Uh, it's it's the future. It's what we're going to be doing long term. But um, in the meantime, we're we're going to wait for Bip Schnorr to get in, and then we're going to implement that on top. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, Mast is like that. That's been a long time coming. Like that's something that was discussed as far back as like 2012, 2013, when Pay to Script Hash was first <laughs> developed. Totally, and arguably Bip Schnorr has been in the making since 2010. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, so I guess uh, on that note, uh, I guess you want to run us through uh, what a DLC is for anybody who doesn't know? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, DLC stands for Discrete Log Contract. Uh, the name is actually a pun. Discrete is spelled uh, D-I-S-C-R-E-E-T. Uh, as opposed to ETE. So it, it is based on knowledge of a discrete log in you know the math sense, but it's also quite private, so that's the pun. But um, anyway, basically it is a simple, quote-unquote, oracle contract um, on Bitcoin, or really on any platform that you want to do. Um, basically you have some oracle, some server, that is responsible for saying what happened for a given event. Uh, Ahead of time, they, you know, commit to public keys for this event that they're going to sign with. Um, And then when the time comes around, they just broadcast a signature. They don't need to know about their users. They don't need to know, you know, how heavy their use is. They don't really need to know anything. They just need to publish their public keys ahead of time and broadcast signatures when the time comes. Um, and, and there's more to that, but I'll, I'll get back to that, I'm sure, in our discussion. Um, and then as far as the, the people using the oracles are concerned, uh, basically how this looks in, in its simplest case, say um, we want to open a discrete log contract over, like, I think that the Bitcoin price is going to go up in the next 24 hours. You think it's going to go down. The Shared Bits Oracle is going to sign a message, either moon or crash. Um, and then what we do is um, we create a funding transaction, which is just a two for two multi-sig between the two of us that we're gonna put our money in. Uh, You don't sign this yet. First, before you sign this, you uh, create a bunch of transactions that spend that funding transactions. Uh, We've been calling these uh, CETs or contract execution transactions. Um, And these are all off-chain. So so like all this stuff is happening off-chain. We're just communicating with each other. And uh, basically, we trade signatures for, in this case, the, the three things that could happen, which would be moon, crash, and, like, nothing after a certain timeout. So if, like, sure bits went down and, like, indefinitely, like, who knows why that would happen. But uh, just to be safe, we have a refund transaction uh, that just gives us back our money after a time lock. Um, and then we also have a transaction that uh, requires that uh, either I have my signature and the signature that I get that I can compute from the moon message, or you have the signature of your own and the crash signature. Um, 
is is so yeah sorry i, I said that in kind of a uh, all over the place way but basically there are three <laughs> contract execution transactions one for moon one for crash and a refund transaction that's time locked um and essentially what actually happens when you're doing a dlc is say it moons i'm right um and what we can do then is we can just spend the funding transaction. So if I come to you and I'm like, see, I was right. Sign this transaction that spends it, sends me some money. Uh, if you cooperate, uh, then great. We don't even need to, you know, broadcast any of these contract execution transactions. We save on fees. Well, I save on fees because I'm getting paid in this case. Um, and also better for privacy, which is something that you get as well. Um, and so uh, then the contract is just done and I get paid. Uh, and in the case where you, like, say disagree, then um, I would have to broadcast my two of two to the blockchain that has my signature and the Oracle signature-ish, asterisk. You compute something from it. So the Oracle can actually tell by looking at the blockchain that they've been used. It's kind of like a key property here. But... Um, yeah, basically, it, it's a way of just by using multisig and time locks to execute uh, Oracle contracts on on Bitcoin, um, and really in any context. Like a you know, someone over in ETH world wants to uh, also be using the Shardbits DLC server. Like, there's nothing stopping them. We're just broadcasting signatures. It's not specific to like script or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And and that could be literally generalized to anything from like market financial contract or constructs to like who was elected president to like um oracle security guard like is does this guy's face actually match this guy totally yeah no you can you can do you know basically anything that you can enumerate uh and it, you know it doesn't have to be like a binary outcome or even like a uh I mean, obviously, it, it does end up having to be finite, but it can be insanely large, and there are ways of doing it pretty efficiently. Like, you can have, like, a price oracle that literally tells you, like, a number to, like, six decimal places or something like this, and there are ways of dealing with it without too much of a headache. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, uh, uh, DLCs basically have a, nice, a, a bunch of nice properties, uh, and, you know, I would argue that compared to other oracle solutions that are out there right now on various... Um, you know, chains and such, this, uh, you know, competes with all of those and works on Bitcoin. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, like, the, the biggest advantage to this is that if engineered properly, like, you know, you, you don't really have a way for your counterparty to collude with the Oracle because the Oracle doesn't even know who's using it. And if they set themselves up in a proper way, like they could literally not even have a way to attempt to track them down or communicate with them. So you can get pretty much like to the point of like collusion isn't literally impossible, but it, it for all intents and purposes is. Yeah. Uh, so so that, that's a good point. For one thing, like it, it would be hard to bribe an Oracle if, you know, they don't have any open channels for bribing. And if they do, you probably shouldn't use them. Um, but even, even that aside, um, there, there are lots of ways to kind of like disincentivize uh, lying or, you know, participating in bribery and, and these kinds of things. And specifically, kind of the, the biggest kind of feature that's built into discrete log contracts is that uh, oracles cannot equivocate, meaning that they can't sign multiple messages with the same keys. Because if they do, then they leak their private keys. Um, and so it's it's very easy to like lateralize them. For example, like I mean, these are their public keys. They can put money on the blockchain that is tied to their public key, and this is the one that they reuse for everything. Oh, um, so and they can bond if, themselves. If, totally, yeah. So you can and anyone can verify that like this person, you know, means business. They've staked a bunch of money on their public key, uh, or you know, just basically have on a pay to pub key on the Bitcoin blockchain, a bunch of Bitcoin there on that pub key. And then um, if they were to sign two different messages for the same event, then they leak their private keys. And anyone who sees both signatures is able to spend all their money. Okay, so that's just like, uh, yeah, I had like, wow, I, I did not even know that. <laughs> about yeah, that. It's, it's actually, it's a feature of uh, Schnorr signatures. Um, so discrete log 
contract uh, Oracle's broadcast Schnorr signatures. That being said, they are possible to execute on Bitcoin right now. You're not actually using that signature like verbatim. You're using it to compute this other stuff. And, you know, we're we're uh, working right now at Shared Bits on, on doing it on the Bitcoin blockchain right now. Um, but uh, essentially for the Oracle, they're just broadcasting Schnorr signatures. And it's a fact that if you sign multiple messages with the same uh, nonce, uh, which is the thing that you commit to for each event, um, then you leak your private keys. And yeah. And so not only is it really bad for you because people can take your money, but now they can also sign for you. So that's not great. Dude, as that's, an some, that's some awesome stuff, man. I mean, you just uh, blew Shinobi's mind. And, uh, you know, we all we were so excited to really get into the special edition. We just jumped right in and we forgot to introduce Janine, who is here with us. Uh, she, uh, she really has some interesting questions for this part of the discussion so janine we're sorry we forgot to introduce you i hope you're doing well today i'm sorry you want to come in hello i did it that's live. fine yeah so. yeah so i mean my question especially when we're talking about um i mean i say smart contract like but this basically is smart contracts on bitcoin at least uh to the same extent uh, or very similar that you see with Ethereum, and it kind of mystifies me how it's like this contract blockchain, and yet they. I'm sorry, I mean, I, that cut out for me just a little bit, uh, just like a mystifying. sentence I missed. Oh, sorry. Okay, so it's mystifying. Oh. <laughs> you did it again. Goddamn. I'm gonna have to type out the question. Okay. Uh, here. <laughs> Ah, comedy of horrible internet access. Well, this is where we just got a comment on our latest video where somebody said, we're all these computer geeks and we can't figure out how to make a good stream. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's technical issues everywhere. Uh, yeah, yeah, so how at, at Scaling Bitcoin, every single presentation was preceded by like 10 minutes of fiddling around with like VGA and HDMI cords. Yeah, I'm the I'm the guy who still has a ten year old uh, Samsung TV that I got for free, so I'm probably not the guy uh, you 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 want to follow if you give a shit about video or audio quality. <laughs> well, that sucks because you're the one in charge. But I think we got like in charge of that whole side of the operation here. But um, I think we got the question. Like, I'm sorry, Janine's wrecked. But, uh, you know, the question is like, uh, yeah, have you run this stuff past like some guys like with these Ethereum projects like Augur and, you know, the way that they see this uh, as solving the Oracle problem and the way that they work with it? Like, how's it go from there? And yeah. Um, so I have mentioned uh, d like how, how DLCs work with with a bunch of people. I don't I, I haven't had any conversations personally with people working on any of these projects and. I also, you know, haven't heard much resistance to DLCs from people who are interested in oracles. Uh, yeah, I, I, I am also interested in how complicated the Ethereum oracle solutions get. Actually, it's kind of like a split. Like, it's either they're just, like, blindly trusting a single oracle someplace because it's, like they're trusting it for other reasons too and it's, like, a server, it's a game or whatever. And, you know, sometimes that's fine, but... Uh, for, for a lot of purposes, you know, there's heavy reliance on on things like uh, TCR-like things. So, like, I know that uh, I, I forget what big project it is. It might be like Maker or something, but they have like some price oracle that's made up of like 17 individuals, and they 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 take like a median. That. We don't know that for sure. Say again. We we are not sure that uh, if you're speaking of the maker DAO, we don't know that those are 17 individuals. Those are just 17 keys, and nobody has any clue who holds them. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. So I guess yeah. Basically, you know, you have this construct where you know they've they've tried to do some trust minimization. You're not trusting a single public key. You're trusting like 17, the median, and I forget whether there's any staking involved or, or these kinds of things. But in general, you know, when I think about the Oracle problem, I like to think that like the correct solution is that trust is required here. And so we should distribute our trust in a minimal way amongst trusted or sorry, trustworthy, uh, you know, 
individuals or you know people who so like clearly you know, have delineate a, who you're trusting instead of just like whoops yeah totally like you you want someone who can be held accountable uh who has like quote unquote like a brand if if you want to like talk about it in those terms because like when it comes to being an oracle when you lie you're like literally providing a digital signature you're giving someone like the most like 64 byte cryptographic proof like super tiny um that that you know you are full of crap and (laughs) and there should be ways of you know having that be like just not uh the correct thing for an oracle to do if you know they want to be viable um yeah so i i guess i i've spent some time digging into a bunch of like the the oracle solutions uh that are on uh, Ethereum. And and I would say actually my main complaint that I see is that like a lot of them require some heavy on-chain machinery in terms of like, um, like you leave an on-chain footprint every time you use some Oracle. And just in general, I have a lot of privacy concerns when it comes to the Oracle platforms I've seen on Ethereum. Whereas uh, I, I think that as far as privacy goes with with Oracle solutions, I think that like DLCs are like I, I can't think of a, a better solution than like nobody learns that you're doing anything in the cooperative case. It looks indistinguishable from just a normal like vanilla Bitcoin transaction. And uh, even in the case of dispute, nobody knows uh, that you use like a specific Oracle or anything like this. And in the case of uh, when Mast gets in, it it still will look uh pretty indistinguishable from any other uh like taproot dispute Mm -hmm. and uh i guess before we kind of circle back um to applying this intelligently on a sound platform like bitcoin uh janine also kind of wanted to know like what's what's your opinion on just like how all these ethereum projects have just totally jumped the gun on like crazy complicated like pie in the sky oracle constructs when they don't even have a solid multi-sig construct yet (laughs) yeah i mean i guess my um from talking to to a lot of of you know people in the eth et al space um my the impression that i get and i think that this is the reason that you get like you know any anytime you have a city that's like a big like tech company hub like boulder San Francisco or wherever, <laughs> then you end up getting a bunch of uh, people working on all of these, let's call them smart contracting platform blockchains. <laughs> but um, basically, I think that um, there, there, there's just kind of like two different, or like as, as communities, they have very different interests and they want something that like works today. And, uh, and, and when I say works, I mean like, you know, like, hey, you can do something right now, today. Um, at the kind of... So, so basically, when they have, like, big developments that I find interesting, it's always, like, very close to the application layer. Um, and so I, I think that there is some useful stuff uh, that happens there because, like, a lot of this stuff can't happen on Bitcoin right now. Not that I... Like, I think that most of this stuff is possible in various off-chain ways, Um in the future of Bitcoin, but it, it doesn't work today. We're still developing lots of stuff like Bitcoin is young. Um, that being said, uh, I, I think that it has been proven time and again that the stuff that we're seeing coming out of Ethereum uh, doesn't compare in terms of like orders of magnitude to the scalability of Bitcoin. Like when, when you're looking at all these things there, you know, it's all on chain. It's all... Uh, designed to to work today so long as you know you only have at most a couple thousand users uh at least in most cases i i don't claim to know every ethereum project out there or anything like that but um yeah i I guess i i would say that like their concern is more so with like getting the thing that works right now uh for various reasons and it's not the thing that will actually work in the future in terms of scalability Though I am somewhat optimistic that like a lot of the stuff that we see that's valuable that's happening on Ethereum can be ported over to Bitcoin via something like the uh, smart contracts on chains proposal or, or something like that. 
So, to translate into my native language of troll, it's my pipe dream and I want it now! Um, uh, so, so long as you preface it like you did, I think that's, that's a fine characterization. <laughs> yeah, right. there's definitely a lot of projects like that going on in Boulder, but it is does make for a lot of interesting discussions around town, and, uh, you know, it is always kind of prefaced or ends with, like, you know, yeah, I wish we could, uh, you know, get this sort of thing happening in Bitcoin, and yeah, it's just something where we understand it takes time, and a lot of people just don't want to wait for that. Yeah, I, and I think that as long as people are building you know, good code when, when they're building on top of these projects, not the projects themselves, but when they're building on top of these projects, as long as they have nice, like modular layered code that lets them like swap out, like say you're using some random network and it gets 51% attacked or something like, so long as you can like hmm. not continue using it, then I think that, you know, it makes sense if you're, if you're trying to do something right now and you need like revenue or something like mm. you can't do certain things on bitcoin uh but so long as it's possible to do them on bitcoin in the future or on you know whatever like platform actually works in the future meaning like if something stops working so long as you can not continue with whatever broken platform you're using i think that it makes at least like commercial sense well, I mean, I've had way less interaction with Ethereum people in, in the real world than you two have, but my few experiences have generally um, ended after uh, like an hour of me browbeating uh, them with what I, I see as logic. Them pretty much just admitting like, yeah, you're right, all of this should be built on Bitcoin and can be done way more intelligently, but everybody's throwing money at all this ETH shit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I have had maybe not the exact same thing, but just like similar understandings when I when I've talked to ETH people that like the you know the stuff I find super exciting is like Taproot and payment points and and things like this, which are uh, as as far as like application or layers of applications go, like super low level, like you know blockchain changes. Whereas uh, you know mo most people who I talk to in the ETH community don't aren't super excited about like developments in ethereum as an underlying thing so much as like things you do with it so to speak so it's just like a different concern and they'll admit that you know this stuff isn't scalable in the long term yeah and i mean like individuals man i mean like yeah it does come out like that and there's some groups here where they are intelligent i mean like uh, i met some guys uh, with a project here locally that was yeah, you know, they were an Ethereum-based project uh, radar relay, but now they've moved towards Lightning and they're moving, they're trying to build out some sort of decentralized exchange and, you know, they do start to move in a direction where maybe it is a, more like a real technological development as far as not just a, you know, it's not all money grabs. These people actually are trying to build out stuff. So yeah, it does make good discussions. And I would note that in general, I've, I've heard a lot of people who, you know, are interested in all of the blockchain projects that, that happen out there and aren't like, you know, Bitcoiners, so to speak, are, are still like from my, you know, interactions with people, everyone seems super excited about lightning. Because uh, it is something that works today that lets you build interesting applications. Um, and I've seen, like, yeah, for example, I, I'm pretty sure Radar has, like, a Lightning app store now. Um, and uh, there's some Ethereum gaming company. Uh, I think they're called Neon District. And they've been doing, like, uh, submarine swaps as part of their payment rails. So that basically they have, like, their data on Ethereum, but their payments can be done over Lightning um and yeah stuff like that I, th I think that like bitcoin is definitely moving forward uh at least i i've seen a lot of people really interested in lightning who aren't bitcoiners mm -hmm. and, you know i guess you know if, if you don't mind like i kind of want to circle back to uh something that is in the steaming pile of crap <laughs> but um you know to, to look at like dlcs as a, just a bitcoin construct and on bitcoin you know, it's. I think potentially this is going to wind up being like the f second, I guess you could argue, 
standardized smart contract on Bitcoin. Like, you know, the whole HTLC construct that Lightning uses, I, I would argue is one of the first. And, you know, that that's pretty much like you're, to make Lightning, just lifting that HTLC structure off chain with an update mechanism. And it's the, you know, the way I see like a DLC, it's the exact same thing. It's, it's an on-chain construct, but all you need to do is just toss in that update mechanism and lift it off chain and it's you know like where where do you really see like the application of this going beyond you know just the the kind of starting examples and also like where where do you see potential combinations or composability of dlcs with like other constructs like that in the long term yeah um so i i would say i i totally agree like as far as you know bitcoin contracts work the 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 general flavor is you put a two of two multisig or if there are more parties involved like an n of n multisig on chain uh called the funding transaction and before you put that on or before you sign that you you know have some kind of state that is attached to that by which i mean like something that spends that that's fully signed um and then you know lightning in in this example is literally just like a payout to two people uh, and Lightning specifically has these update mechanisms where you can add and uh, add new things that spend that output um, while revoking old things. Uh, and, and DLCs, like you mentioned, it has a two for two on chain, and then off chain you have a bunch of these states depending on kind of what happens uh, with respect to like an oracle, uh, and then things settle on chain. And it is totally possible, like routing over a single chan or sorry, not routing. Uh, executing these kinds of contracts over a single channel is very simple. All you do is you put that funding transaction in the channel rather than on the chain, and then you do an update to move the balances depending on what the oracle said in the case of agreement. And in the case of disagreement, you have to close on chain and then close the discrete log contract on chain as well. Um, so yeah, in, in general, I would say any any contract like this that's just like a two for two multi sig with some state, uh, w- with some spending transactions that are fully signed, attached to it, uh, it's it's well known. You know, it's 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 very easy to do this over a single payment channel. Routing is not a solved problem, so far as I understand, at least in any you know remotely general case. Like even for DLCs, I don't personally know how they would be routed trustlessly. I know some ways where you can minimize a ton of trust and, and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, um, in order to like route these things fully trustlessly, we don't currently know how to do that or if that's possible. But yeah, in, in general, in terms of composability of these things, first of all, I think that um, kind of like the channels of the future will... Uh, so, so like right now, the reason that routing is so important on the Lightning Network is it's not super feasible to have to open a channel with everyone who you're going to be interacting with uh, because that kind of defeats the purpose. You're going on chain all the time, takes 30 minutes to open the channel, etc. Um, not very private. Um, and so the idea is that you only have to be well-connected enough to route to anybody who you want to deal with. Now, for a lot of like these kinds of use cases or for these kinds of contracts, um, there, there could be more money involved, in which case it might make sense to, you know, take some time, uh, go on chain, these kinds of things. But uh, as a more general thing, I think that we'll see things like channel factories, where so long as you're in the same, like, factory as a certain person, then you can open any of these kinds of contracts with them without going on chain um, uh, with, you know asterisks on all of this stuff it's it's not simple to do but um i i think that in general uh kind of the the future of bitcoin smart contracts lie largely in kind of so getting into composability these um i mean really there's there's two parts to to a contract there's uh external data being brought in via like an oracle and then there's like the processing of data including say those signatures um and uh dlcs kind of like solve this first problem for bitcoin and arguably the second problem can be solved by something like and i've mentioned this already but um uh, there's this proposal on the bitcoin dev mailing list called smart contracts unchained 
that I find super interesting where you basically have, uh, I mean, I, he calls it an escrow, uh, but I, it, it's basically a lot like an oracle or an escrow. But anyway, um, point being, I think that it'll be possible in the future to execute like arbitrary smart contracts off chain in a way where the people who you're trusting to enforce this contract are a trustworthy and b you trust them very little like you don't they don't need to know anything about what you're actually doing all they all each individual does is if you're an oracle you're responsible for a specific event and you don't know you're being used and if you are enforcing processing that can't be done by bitcoin then like all you see are like zeros and ones and you're enforcing some rules you can't deduce like what the contract is actually about because all you're getting is like signatures uh that you can't tell where they come came from or what they sign um and these kinds of things because mm-hmm. you know it's like that <clears throat> like one of the first examples like i thought of um as far as like you know really trying to apply this somewhere and i'm not even sure i would really call this a DLC per se because it, it kind of breaks some of the, the privacy models but you know like ig- ignore the liquidity constraints of shit being locked up on a route but you know what if you made a lightning payment to buy something online and made the payment conditional on an oracle like your postal service actually delivering a box with like some kind of marking or code on it Totally, yeah, and and this is exactly the kind of thing. So, so this in this particular instance, all we need is payment points on Lightning, because then exactly what we were talking about earlier with escrow contracts mm-hmm. on Lightning, like this is exactly like the kind of use case that that is built for. Yeah, and so it's like you know you can really like compose like all of these totally, primitives yeah. in and so I think many ways. To, to kind of make it crystal clear, like the, the primitive that Lightning gives us that we're able to compose with things is proof of payment. So you get that pre-image if and only if you pay. It's kind of like your atomic receipt on the Lightning network. Now, right now, that's kind of a white lie if you say that, and I you know, still say it. But um, if right now on the Lightning network, you have this payment pre-image, but everyone along the route gets it. <laughs> so if, you know, if, if you're using it literally as proof of payment without anything else, without throwing in the user's pub key or anything like that, then uh, it's not actually proof of payment because a bunch of people get it. But when you move to payment points, since everyone has a different point, only one person ends up actually learning the pre-image to the point in the invoice. And so what you have there is like your proof of payment, um, and that's kind of what you can use in correspondence with other applications, right? Like kind of what I mentioned with like selling signatures, right? It's this way of um, using proof of payment as your your way of enforcing trustless signature sales or um, likewise for, yeah. So, so I guess I, I would see DLCs are all, all they are in, in terms of like data is it's just a signature that you can use. Uh, and that you can compute useful things from, uh, but it's really all you need in order to enforce other contracts. Um, and as far as Lightning is concerned, like proof of payment is kind of the big thing, which is one of the reasons why I'm really excited about payment points is because what it is, is it's like, let's redo proof of payment so it actually works. Mm-hmm. And that's how like applications are actually able to... Uh, use the Lightning Network in all sorts of interesting ways. So, for example, uh, at SuredBits, we have these APIs that are monetized over Lightning. And how, how we, so we, have, we call them paid APIs. So that's Payments Atomic Information Decryption. But um, basically what, what that means is you send us a request, say you want to know some like historical, like what was the BTC USD trading pair priced at on Bitfinex, in January of 2019 or something like this, right? You send us a request um, and then we respond with uh, an invoice and the data encrypted with the payment pre-image, with the proof of payment. So basically what that means is you can be assured that if you pay, you get the data. And if you don't pay, then you don't get the data. And that is kind of like the... I would argue like probably the simplest use of proof of payment is just like using it as an encryption key. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me and uh, me and Chris were uh, talking about that uh, when we had him on uh, around the time Rick met you. 
Yeah, I, and, that was like the first thing, you know, after we went through the basics is it was kind of like, okay, let, let's probe the weaknesses here and see how much he's been thinking about them. And it's like he, like I couldn't find a single, like, you know, potential problem that he wasn't thinking about comprehensively in the long term. Totally, yeah. And another cool thing with this is that um, it with with payments over the Lightning Network, they have the feature that the person getting paid doesn't need to know where this payment originated. Like, all they know is the last hop. And so we're actually pr- currently at Shredbits. We're pursuing uh, constructing DLC oracles uh, that get paid for their use, but don't but without like compromising the fact that they're not supposed to learn anything about their users. So, um, as I mentioned, if like the Oracle ends up getting used on chain, they can't look at the chain and find that out. Um, and so basically what we have is just like a paid API where you pay us for our commitments to events. Um, and you pay us for our signatures and we don't actually learn who you are. So long as you know, you're, like if if you really care and you you know use Tor or any other of these kinds of solutions, we have like no way of learning anything about you, VPN Tor. That's um, pretty awesome. And I mean, and, even with and, rendezvous payments, you won't really need to be so extreme in guarding that. Yeah, and and just in general, I think um, Lightning is kind of like the best way to do private, like you know, payments, um, and that's perfect for DLCs, right? Like you can pay DLC oracles when you need to use them. And right, these are like tiny numbers. Like I, mean, I think, I forget whether it's like a hundred or a thousand Satoshis for like a signature, but it's not a large amount. Um, and you know, they can go pretty arbitrarily small to the dust limit uh, as far as the payments to the oracle go. But they also, you know, they, they act as like an incentive. Like you want your oracles to be sustainable and to have incentives to tell the truth and, and these kinds of things. Um, and, and I think that like lightning is a a great way to do that. Yeah. That's awesome. Like, you know, you you know, it's like, you you guys are like seriously one of the, or not the most like underappreciated company in the lightning space. Like you've just blown my mind twice as far as like things you can do with the DLC construct I had no fucking clue about. And then like DLCs are something I've been thinking about since Tage first wrote about them. Totally. Yeah. yeah and ho- we're currently on, on Bitcoin S on, on Bitcoin Scala. We're working on, uh, or I'm currently working on the uh, client stuff for, for the server stuff. Uh, which is almost ready for release. So I, I won't say too much more about that. But keep keep your eyes open for Assured Bits DLC Oracle coming soon. Nice. Yeah, man, that's like the work you guys are doing over there. It is really underrated. I mean, when we brought Chris on, that was one of those uh, special editions where, yeah, it was really just a good discussion. And yeah, we plumbed through the system and it was just like, yeah, this all just makes sense. And yeah, we've been having some great discussions about lightning where you've blown my mind several times at just our regular meetups. And I'm sure you've uh, blown our mind of some of our listeners, but uh, you know, I guess uh, before we move out of this, was there anything else you wanted to talk about with payment points and discrete log contracts? Otherwise uh, we're just going to get right to yelling at you. You're <laughs> responsible. Um, I, I, before we get there, I uh, just realized I forgot to mention uh, so another important feature of DLCs is that they're easily composable, meaning, and when I say composable, what I mean here is that the oracles are composable. So it's it's very, like, we've been talking about things in terms of, like, you have a oracle or an oracle, um, and you're, you know, trusting it to provide its signature, when in reality, how this is probably actually going to look is you're going to have to have, like, multiple DLC oracles kind of all over the place, uh, and they don't know like who's being used with who or anything like this, right? They're just broadcasting signatures, and then it's very easy for the clients to compose them in kind of the normal uh, key aggregation under Schnorr way, because right, they're just broadcasting uh, Schnorr signatures, and you can compose Schnorr signatures uh, by just treating them as like the partial signatures and adding them together and these kinds of things. So we we don't think that there's like a future where like. Well, we hope that the future isn't just people using shared bits, but we think that there's a market for there being like multiple 
you know, trustworthy oracles out there. I know that Digital Garage is is working, or Crypto Garage or Digital Garage, I forget which one they're uh, related, but um, they're working on on DLC oracles and there there are others out there and that's not a bad thing. See, you just did it again. You just fucking did it again. You had to blow my mind with DLC possibilities before we moved on, didn't you? You (laughs) just had to do it. I'm trying to soften the blow. I don't know what's coming next. (laughs) <laughs> That's all right. The next, really, the only thing I uh, wanted to just uh, get your opinion on was uh, some of the uh, topical things going on right now as far as with uh, maybe you can comment on some of it with the uh, vulnerability that was recently exposed with mm. the Lightning Network, or you could comment on uh, the Turbo Channels with uh, Olympus and Zap Wallet and what the possibilities are with that. And, uh, yeah, would... Uh, um the vulnerability you want oh sure uh yeah what's going on with the vulnerability let's take that one yeah first. so basically um in the bolts it did not mention that you should validate um or, or that you must validate uh the uh funding transaction for your channel uh currently ba- basically all three lightning implementations followed the spec to like a t and uh they didn't do this thing that I was probably just like the person writing the bolt was just like, yeah, of course. Uh, or, or, or maybe it just slipped their mind to write it down. But um, essentially what was happening is all three in, in various shapes, all three lightning implementations were just taking your counterparty's word at what was in the funding transaction. Uh, and essentially what that meant is that they could just like steal all the funds in no your man. lightning transaction if you you know didn't validate these things. Uh, and you know all all three lightning implementations have fixed it since then. I believe it's been added to the bolt since then, but the vulnerability was just published uh, right now, uh, and it's been exploited. Um, and basically, it's just like, whoops, we forgot to write good software on this part. Um, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, kind of, is... it's kind of an embarrassing bug. Well, yeah, it's I... two years in, right? Like we, we're running into bugs. Well, I mean, that yeah. is like I think. A, a real interesting issue because the whole problem is like everybody knew that should be being done but it wasn't in the spec and so yeah. everybody just blindly followed that and it's like you know it's, it's, i think the core lesson here is like shit is way too early to be just blindly implementing a spec and not looking at every part of that spec like i don't trust you what's wrong what's missing like you know what I mean? Yeah, and and I I wouldn't say that like the spec hasn't gone through intensive peer review, but that being said, like obviously there was still this kind of like mistake by omission um that, you know, has been pretty embarrassing for for, you know, the lightning. Uh it's not good optics, <laughs> but yeah. um yeah, I mean it's it's fixed now assuming you update your node if you're listening and you have a lightning node go go check out uh this this vulnerability and and see that you're on the right version make sure you update otherwise you're you're plainly trusting your peers that your funding transactions are what they should be but um, yeah I mean it, it's one of those things where like if if anybody had been like if I was giving a presentation on the Lightning Network, I would like say that this is what was happening because I you know everyone assumes that that's what's happening, uh, and it just turns out as far as implementation goes, uh, everyone forgot to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's where like yeah we're just two years in. It is all patched up now, but uh, yeah, that's uh, it's just something that happens with development. Well, it just goes to show, like, you know, if you are going to get into Lightning development and you're doing more than building applications on stuff, you're actually implementing it. Like, you should be looking at that spec like it is a devious bastard that is trying to stab you in the back, no matter how much review it's gone through, because, like, this is all still insanely early. Yeah, and and it's also, it's like, uh, you know, b- everything around Bitcoin and, and Lightning, it's it's a system where like absolutely everything needs to go right as far as like the cryptography and the validation is concerned. Like if, if any one thing is off, then you probably lose money. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's, it's like a really complicated system and, you know, defensive practices are good. And yeah, I, I guess it's it's one of those face palms of a, of a vulnerability. 
<laughs> All right. Well, so yeah, you're right. And I mean, you know, I'm sure we'll still bring this back up on our main show because it is a big story and we'll dig into it some more. But uh, totally. what do you think about um, Turbo Channels and uh, Olympus and our friend Jack Mallers and what's going on with Zap? Yeah, uh, and and just to make sure I'm I'm thinking of the right thing, that's where you can get money directly on Lightning without going on chain from like your bank account. Correct. Yeah, I mean I don't. Pers- I I've been meaning to, and I haven't gotten the chance uh, for various reasons to uh, look into how it actually works, which oh, I am very seconds. interested. Um, in. It's a He's concept got that BitRefill came up with called the Turbo Channel. They just open a channel with shit pushed to your side and let you spend from it before it confirms. Right, and I, I have heard of this from BitRefill, but I guess the the thing happening with like Jack Mallers, where it he, it's like non custodial in any sense. Uh, how 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 is it that you like? How do you get channels? Without it's, opening channels, no. It just uses the the turbo channel thing so that you can like spend the the second you hit the button. Oh, interesting. Um, I, I yeah, I guess I, I still have some uh, That's a, questions in my head as far as implementation go. But uh, yeah, they're not they're not important to you know talking about how great this stuff is because I mean obviously uh, onboarding for for Bitcoin is hard enough. Onboarding for Lightning is a layer on top of that, meaning you need to onboard people onto Bitcoin and then onboard them further onto Lightning. Um, and so, you know, like if, personally, like, you know, Sherdbits as a, as a business that requires that we get paid in Lightning, like it's a huge barrier to entry uh, to, you know, have someone sync right. a full net main net or sorry, a full main net node or, you know, anything of, of that sort. And then on top of that, get your lightning node running and, and all these kinds of things. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're actually like actively pursuing various like light client esque things like Neutrino and, and these kinds of things. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, it's pretty uncontroversial that it's a win if we can just like skip the Bitcoin part and get straight to the lightning because <laughs> uh, <laughs> the user experience is better. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I still have questions as far as implementation goes, but that's just because I, I haven't had the chance to, to do enough research on on my end on this stuff. Uh, there's that's always right. we so know. much to follow. But... Well, we, yeah, we know you've yeah. been super busy over there with uh, Shirt Bits doing all these blog posts. I mean, we've covered two, you know, two groups of your blog posts. We know you've been working a lot on those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I... I I'm super excited to to see how that stuff unfolds and see people use it. Well, yeah, we should be just... having him in here uh, real soon so we could talk about it. Plump Exciting. But it's it's just, you know, it's like I think Turbo Channel, like, I don't really like them because it's like whoever is uh-huh. opening that exposes themselves to the risk of getting screwed and cheated. But it's like that's your risk. And I mean, if it's if you want to take that risk and onboard people, in a way smoother way like all right totally yeah. and and you know it's if if you're it, it's a way to become a giant lightning hub and that you know has its own um benefits in terms of like routing fees and all sorts of other things mm-hmm. all right man yeah i mean like it's a i don't know i think it's gonna be great we'll talk to him about it some more but uh yeah, man, it's been great having you in here to talk to you about this stuff. I've been talking to you at these meetups for such a long time, and I've been wanting to bring you on the show. I mean, like we talked with uh, Chris, and ever since then, and just like getting into sure bits and figuring out what you guys are doing, it's always some awesome stuff. And you know, I'd like to point our listeners again to the show notes. We'll have your uh, blog post down there for sure bits. And uh, any more information you want to put out there? Um, I, I have nothing in in mind i mean uh and anyone who's super interested in this stuff should feel free to join our slack uh if you go to the shouldbits.com slash ai uh pretty much at the top of the page there's a link to join our slack we've got a public slack um other than that yeah i mean uh let me know what you think of my blog posts (laughs) (laughs) Fantastic. i don't have a writing background i have a math background oh you did really good with it you know i like i said i i had some issues to get past but like i was able to get through and really understand it sweet (laughs) all right and just before we do go uh also a reminder you know uh nadav will be at that berlin uh lightning 
Hack Day as Lightning uh, Conference, yeah. Lightning Conference. And uh, Janine will be there too. She hasn't been able to comment because her internet is uh, in a terrible situation over there. But she'll also be there. And so, yeah, you can see Nadav there. Yeah, I hope I'll be able to hear your voice next time. Yeah, yeah. At, at conference, I mean. <laughs> oh, yay. Hi. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah, probably won't work for very long, but hello. <laughs> Hi. Well, that's all right. I'll, hopefully I'll see you in Berlin. Yep, right. I'll be around. So I guess on uh, that note, you know, thank you for uh, coming on to Dab. This was absolutely fascinating. Uh, sorry you couldn't actually talk uh, most of the time, Janine. But, you know, on that note, uh, check out his, his writings and Pay attention to shared bits because this this is this company is doing a lot of amazing stuff in, in lightning and it seems like they're too far under the radar. So fix that, folks. Appreciate Adios. it. See y'all later, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, you have to wait for your head. Yeah, you have to wait for your head.